Okay, guys. I'm sure the people will continue to trickle in. And I realized in my excitement last week about introducing the first grand rounds of the new year, I forgot to make a really important announcement. So we are the Department of Medicine. We're a plucky bunch. We are educators who get our reward out of seeing students learn. We are researchers that absolutely rejoice when we get a grant or we get a manuscript accepted, you know, after five submissions. And we're clinicians who are feel so happy when finally, after the 15th version of antihypertensive medications, you finally get somebody controlled. We are, above all, the individuals who thrive on deferred gratification. We love it. This is what we live for, is the virtue of doing a good job. But wouldn't it be nice if every once in a while, somebody gave you something a little bit more tangible, something a little bit more concrete and sort of immediate. So I would like to announce, shall we call it a Grand Rounds Attendance Incentive. Every month, beginning this month, Jason Puckett will add up the number of times that each one of us has attended Grand Rounds and the people that have the top attendance will get a Panera gift card. Now, let me just say, it's not gonna be a Panera gift card for $120, but it will be a Panera gift card. So, you know, to, uh, I know that there are people who are gonna continue to come in, you know, who are not here yet, who will not have heard this announcement. And while I know that everybody in this room believes in fair play and would certainly tell their colleagues about this, we will be sending out the announcement also over email so that everybody knows about this. So uh, with that, I have no other announcements. Um, and I am excited that today uh, one of our own is going to be delivering grand rounds, um, Dr. Sutton uh, from the Division of Cardiology. And to introduce him, I'd like to ask Dr. Boley to come up to the podium. Good morning. I, would, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Sutton today, one of our uh, uh, stars in cardiology. His uh, um, pedigree is impeccable. He received his uh, medical degree from Johns Hopkins uh, and then had an MBA uh, at the Johns Hopkins uh, Carey School of Business. He did all of his training at Hopkins, including his residency, cardiology fellowship, and uh, uh, clinical cardiology electrophysiology fellowship. And uh, when he finished in 2011, we were uh, fortunate enough to recruit him here to Louisville. And he has uh, become a key player in our program. Uh, he is uh, currently the clinical vice chair uh, for the Department of Medicine. Uh, he has a unique uh, penchant for combining uh, healthcare and uh, business and uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, uh, and so has developed a series of initiatives that are truly unique uh, among our faculty. He's the Assistant Dean for Health Strategy and Innovation. He um, is the founder and co-director of the Center for Health Process Innovation. Uh, the mission of this center is to identify, evaluate, and implement innovative solutions to rising healthcare costs, inadequate patient safety and health system inefficiencies. Uh, and uh, uh, has started a number of initiatives also in the educational realm in that direction. Uh, he's um, uh, in his spare time, he's a clinical electrophysiologist and uh, helps us with the electrophysiology program, particularly now, he is uh, heroically um, holding the fort. We have only one electrophysiologist left. And so he's, um, he's carrying the load by himself and he's on a call uh, every night, basically, right? Right, Brad? Uh, so he's doing a great job in carrying our clinical program. He's um, 
He was the medical director of the outpatient clinic for the Department of Medicine until uh, 2018 and uh, uh, has developed a number of educational initiatives for students. Uh, so he's the co-director of the course for uh, cardiovascular curriculum for the second year medical students. He developed the business of medicine and leadership curriculum for medical students. He is the co-creator and co-director of the distinction track in business and leadership for medical students, and is the director of a combined MD and MBA program at the university. Uh, in addition to that, is now fellowship director for electrophysiology. So he's doing a lot of things, uh, does not sleep very much, he's very busy, and he's making great contributions. Thanks, Brad, for all that you're doing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Exactly. Good morning. I think this is on. Good morning, Department of Medicine. If this were a class I were teaching, I would make all you guys in the back come forward, but I won't do that today. So uh, this is different than what you usually get for Grand Rounds. This is the sort of stuff I like to talk about, um, frankly, more than electrophysiology usually. Um, here are my disclosures, some consulting fees and, and uh, speaking fees in industry. I want to talk a little bit about what I consider the tipping points. Anybody familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's idea of the tipping point? You all should read that book. We'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have heard about this transition of, uh, to value-based care, right? This idea that we're not going to extract volume and get paid for volume, but to try to make it valuable, what we do. Okay, And we'll define valuable, or what I think value is, uh, and how we, we really, as a, as a country, have redefined how we get paid, particularly on the hospital and provider side, how we get paid for the kind of care we deliver and the models in which we deliver that care. I want to talk a little bit about our experience here locally and how we try to uh, prepare our trainees for this sort of new world that we live in. And then maybe a little bit more fun, what I see on the horizon that I think could disrupt this space and, and really hopefully address some of the pain points that all of us feel every day in our clinical practice. This talk is, is a hard one to continue to update because legislation is always changing, um, the landscape's always changing, but this is an article I came across actually just recently, and it's interesting. It describes how some of the models of care initially identified and developed in the 1990s have really contributed to the decline in the middle class of America. So what do I mean by that? Specifically, preferred provider networks. This idea that the lack of price transparency allows for one-off contract negotiations such that many systems and many employer-based health care plans in particular are paying high rates, two, three, ten times what Medicare pays. And so the idea here is that it's really the prices that drive health care costs. And this is an increasingly recognized phenomenon. Prices as set by price, by, by sort of the, uh, the ledger that the hospital creates or the contract negotiated between payer and provider are a big contributor and have nothing to do in and of themselves with the quality of care delivered, efficiency of care delivered, or the outcomes, frankly. So that's sort of what, what we're trying to address with a lot of these new models of care. You guys are familiar, I pro probably, I hope you are, that you realize now um, hospitals have to publicly post what it costs to get care for each individual you know, potential, potential item of care. So they basically are posting their charge master by, by federal mandate now. And what it means is, you know, you, you have all these sort of healthcare abbreviations and no one can find anything. So it's this completely useless charge master that patients can't navigate. But it's, it's available. Uh, and there's an entire industry built around price transparency. So our healthcare economy is increasing at double the rate of the general economy. Um, I used to have a lot of economic slides in this talk about we're approaching 20% of our GDP. And I think people by and large know that. So I won't belabor that. But the marketplace, in my mind, is plagued by lack of competition, which drives prices up, security and prices and outcomes, and that's a big issue. That's just getting real significant pressure at the federal level to, to go away. And you will see increasingly your systems, outcomes, mortality data, for example, cost effectiveness data, for example, publicly available. They'll be able to compare hospitals based on that, and frankly, they'll be able to compare providers based on that. So your individual NPI level metrics for outcomes and procedures that you do, for example, will be publicly available in the near future. 
Um, and there are winners, right? When you have this irrational market and you have a lack of transparency, a lack of symmetry of information, you have winners and losers. So um, someone is profiting from this system, which is why it's been so hard to change. And there's a tremendous lobby behind that. In the middle class, if you look at healthcare expenditures relative to other things, right, this is the piece that's driving costs. This is the piece that's putting people into foreclosure, you know, second mortgages and, and really economic despair in the middle class. This is a little hard to see, but what this shows are common conditions, COPD, diabetes, hospitalization, pneumonia, heart failure, and the price variation. So for Medicare patients, so $3,000 versus $99,000. What's the difference in the care received at hospital A versus hospital B? Probably very little, right? Where are the outcomes attached to this? Did you get 15 times better care at hospital B? No. But we charge what we charge, right? And that's, that's an artifactual number. And so the estimates are usually 20, 30 percent cost savings to be accomplished if we had real symmetry of information. If you want to buy a car today, you go to truecar.com and you know what someone else paid for it, you know what the median price is in your region, you know, you know, you punch in your zip code, and you come prepared with data. There are reviews on that car, you know what the, what the historical rate of, of repairs are on that car. We don't have that in healthcare, at least yet. So I want to talk a little bit about value. Michael Porter at Harvard defines value essentially as um, what are we getting for what are we doing, right? So one of the things that we've looked at, and I, I would say in particular this department has been tackled with uh, focusing on this a lot, right, are deficits. So profitability, turns out, not a reliable indicator of value in healthcare. And this is where our disparate system, hospital over here, hospital over here, decentralized department, not everybody talking to everybody, different EMR systems, hard to get data. This is where we really suffer. Because we don't have a good way to put the value story together with all these silos of information. We have some RVUs and we have rough idea of how much money we're losing. But I would argue that we don't have a good way to articulate our value, and that's a big problem. In my mind, quality is not the same as value. So I get a little nauseous, I get tired of hearing about quality projects, this and that. But value is broader to me. Quality is hard to find. Value is, I think, a more inclusive, um, underutilized concept and focuses uh, really on outcomes as opposed to process measures. And so there's this critical need to define how we are going to measure what we do. Uh, and it's really interesting. What we really need is systematic real-time data on adverse events, real-time feedback to help physicians make decisions. If you're in the EMR, why is it that we can't get, at the time of prescribing a prescription of any pharmaceutical, real-time pricing for that patient's insurance right then and there, and compare antibiotic A, antibiotic B, both of which are clinically indicated, which one's cheaper for our patient? We have no idea. Why is that a problem still, 2019? Shouldn't be, and I think technology is going to fix that for us. So this is a this is a study from Circulation. So Dr. Bowie's familiar with this journal, um, and this is a study that was published by one of our former fellows, Harsh Gowala, which is really interesting to me. You're all familiar with the Heart Failure Readmissions Reduction Initiative, right? So this is a federally mandated core measure that says we want to reduce the number of heart failure patients. So patients who came in the hospital, primary diagnosis of heart failure, which is a coded diagnosis, may or may not be accurate as it's coded. But we want you to stay out of the hospital because the hospital is a really expensive place to get care. And at the end of the day, you stay out of the hospital, we think we're going to decrease costs. Great. Does it work? So they compared low quartile and highest quartile readmissions rates. And what they showed is that mortality was higher among those who had low readmissions. People died more often when you kept them out of the hospital. So what this speaks to is this is the wrong metric, right? And in fact, we see this with a lot of these value-based measures or core measures, particularly the early ones that were loosely predicated on clinical data but had nothing behind them in the way of evidence that said this measure as implemented this way will improve patient outcomes. In fact, many, many times they, they don't improve patient outcomes. They may make patients worse. So you've got to wonder, are we re measuring the right things? This is venothromboembolic pr prophylaxis. How does this do? This is 2010 hospital claims analysis. So almost 3,000 hospitals showed that you happen to check this box, right, this popped up when you're admitting patients or discharging patients, 
no relationship between how you do in this metric and clinical outcomes. How much money have we spent in hospital systems implementing these pathways, right? This is millions of dollars because if, at the end of the day, if you don't perform well in this, there are reimbursement cuts. There's, there's Medicare DRG cuts, right? And so this is, a, this is something people have invested in, and you have to wonder to what end from a clinical standpoint. You guys are probably familiar with Peter Pronovost. So he ran the Armstrong Center at Hopkins. Um, he's a MacArthur Fellow. He's a well-known guy. Focuses primarily on, on quality, safety. And um, you know, his call was, was this. Let's eliminate unnecessary, unreliable metrics, and let's figure out what are some standard validated metrics. It's longer and more time intensive and more expensive to validate these than it is to just say, this sounds good, let's do it. Uh, but it's worthwhile, right? Because now we're, we're billions of dollars as a, as a country invested in metrics that may not actually be useful at all. What does this cost us today? So $15.4 billion each year in physician practice is spent on reporting quality metrics. So it's not cheap. People are having to do this manual data collection and data abstraction. You know, we put processes and nurse navigators in place, and we have a whole infrastructure to try to do well. Um, look at this, 785 hours per physician per year. Average cost of $40,000 to see nine more patients per week. This is real money. This is, speaks to access, right? Speaks to healthcare costs. Is this a good use of our time as physicians? No, I would argue. The government's starting to realize this, so to, to their credit, CMS has said, you know what, it's pretty convoluted, pretty complex, let's try to simplify the number of things we're really measuring. Um, so it's eliminating 25 measures, reduces duplication, and the next iteration of these metrics really uh, is estimated to save a bunch of money. Um, hospitals now have to have an electronic record available at discharge, and they gotta post their prices on the internet. Uh, as I mentioned, the prices aren't in sort of layman's terms, at least in the way they're categorized, so it, it, there's work here. The other thing they're trying to do is to facilitate interoperability. So that is the idea that information can flow seamlessly electronically from hospital A to hospital B or from discharge record to ER. This idea that you don't have to fax 2019, we're still the only industry in the world that faxes uh, records from one place to another. I thought this was interesting. So there's a guy named Alex Azar who uh, is at Health and Human Services. He's actually a, a Trump uh, appointee, but really progressive in his comments. And this is just recently. This is November. He said, real experimentation with episodic bundles requires a willingness to try mandatory bundles. And I'm going to get into the history a little bit of, of bundle-based payments. He wants to pay for outcomes, not process, not just checking the box. He wants price transparency so that when you see a pharmaceutical ad on TV, they have to tell you what it's going to cost you at least retail price, right? Um, and for those who are willing to take on more risk, that is, we're gonna share potential downside as a system, the government's gonna say, you know what, I don't care what you do or how you do it, just demonstrate better outcomes, you're on your own, you wanna take more risk, great, we're gonna leave you alone. We're not gonna mandate how you do it and what processes you use. And then important for this group is to know that they're simplifying e m codes. So my understanding is we're going to two levels of codes Right, so level one, two, three, four, five. Billing will now include, I think there's level two and level five, something like that. So simplifying the number of reimbursement codes based on level of, of patient complexity and, and visit complexity to simplify billing. Now, of course, that's gonna probably mean that the government saves money, otherwise they wouldn't be taking the time to do that, but uh, hopefully more efficient. So what we've done here over time is we move now from this fee for service, I do more, I get paid more, I'm incentivized potentially to do things that are of questionable value and benefit to increasing collaborative risk sharing models. What does that look like? The idea here is that you're moving care from the hospital, this old model of everything's done, one stop shop, and we have everything in one place where it's really expensive and pushing care to the periphery. Okay? Enabled by technology, by interoperability, by patient engagement, by apps etc. And hopefully creating a network around which patients are cared for. Okay? That's the vision. One of the ways they're trying to do this is they're, is they're creating these ideas called bundled payments or episodic payment models. And these have been around for a while. The orthopedic surgeons have been very successful 
they're utilizing bundles for joint replacement. And so what these initiatives do is they try to organize payment around an episode of care. And that episode of care is not just this particular procedure or this particular uh, point of contact in the hospital. It is a defined around a disease state or a procedure. So you might have a bundled payment around acute myocardial infarction. So patient comes in, diagnosis is made, bundle starts. 90 days from that time is your episode. That's the episode around which the bundle exists. And what happens is you get a contractually agreed upon price, and everybody that that patient touches, whether it's inpatient, rehab, cardiac rehab, pharmaceuticals, imaging, everybody is reimbursed as part of that bundle. Set price, good luck, do what you will. If you do better than target price, you make money. If you do worse than target price, you're writing a check. Okay? So it's, it's meant to reduce variation, standardize workflows and pathways, and improve quality and care coordination to lower cost, improve outcomes. So this is just sort of how the cardiac bundles as proposed by the government would work, and it's just like I said, fixed target price at the end of the year, total cost for Medicare A and B, fee for service is compared to target, any savings go back to the hospital, any shortfall, you pay a check back to the Medicare group. So what's the problem with, with this in particular? What's the problem with trying to drive system behavior when you reconcile this at year's end based on retrospective fee-for-service payments? Right. There's no real-time feedback. I'm a doctor taking care of a patient. How does this affect me? How does this drive my decision-making? How do I then, how, I'm not really incentivized to, to improve care coordination. The system here might have some high-level visibility to what the overall cost of care is, but to an individual, individual provider, it's really hard to see how this is going to drive behavior and improve care coordination. Unless I put you on the hook and give you some data in, in the meantime that says, you know, you're referring too much to rehab or you're referring to rehabs with too long a stay or whatever the issue is, right? Without additional granularity here that can really impact my behavior, um, I think these are going to have limited impact. Do they lead to better outcomes? So, so Maryland is a unique state. I spent 12 years in Maryland. And they've always had an exception to the way they're reimbursed at the hospital level. And they took it one step farther in 2014 and it essentially said, all payers are going to agree to a fixed price, a fixed annual amount for hospital services, quality adjusted, and we're getting rid of fee-for-service. So Maryland hasn't had fee-for-service since 2014 at the hospital level. Sounds a lot like Canada, frankly. So this is an interesting experiment of sort of a, of, of a single payer model almost, even though there are multiple payers, they agree to the same terms, uh, in the US. And what they did, what they aspired to do was prevent, to reduce preventable conditions by 30% in five years, okay? Here's what they achieved by year one. There was a 21% Medicaid expansion during this time. They saved $116 million, reduced preventable conditions by 26%. So that's pretty impressive. Here's a list of all the preventable conditions they wanted to improve, and they all got better except with the exception of substance reaction after presence of foreign body after operating. So basically, somebody left more sponges and, and patients at the end of the year for whatever reason. But other than that, all of these got better. Decubitus ulcers, DKA with coma, et cetera, et cetera. So this model worked for the state. There's one big problem here with this model, and it's that it didn't include the providers at all. So for the first time ever, you had academic institutions in the state where the hospitals reimbursed on a capitated basis, this sort of global capitated model, but the doctors are still getting paid fee for service. So their incentives aren't aligned. They're not working together. And I want to do more procedures to get paid. The hospital wants me to do fewer procedures. So it was, a, it was an interesting experiment. It was an incredibly well-developed sort of system that aligned physician incentives and hospital incentives. And they're fixing that with the next model. Uh, which, where, where they're really doubling down on this. The general consensus is that value-based payment models are a good idea, they're understudied, we don't know exactly how to implement them, and they're not penetrating the market as quickly as we expected, and therefore they haven't really been effective at generating real cost savings. One of the things I wanted, so I, I, I saw this great article by Milton Packer, he's a well-known cardiologist, you guys know who he is. 
It was a very pessimistic but honest article where he said, if you think medical schools are exemplars of bustling, productive environment, teaching innovation and patient care, you're living in the wrong century. What he meant was this. And he outlined the history of medical schools in the United States. There were 400 medical schools in the 1800s. They were all private. And you wrote a big check, and you got a kind of a half education. Um, 1935, after the Flexner Report, 66 medical schools were left. A monopoly was created, and there was a lot of power in that monopoly. NIH then prioritizes biomedical research. And research overhead becomes the cornerstone of the academic center's business model. So the tripartite mission is alive and well, research teaches patient care. This is the first half of the 20th century. Tuition is now a tiny fraction of revenues. And so guess who has all the power in a system like this? Is it the people who educate? No. It's the people who control the revenue. OK, so this actually rang really true with, with my experience in an academic medical center. This piece here, and this you can debate this. This is a little controversial. But his argument was these vestiges are in place but powerless. And that the real power lies with healthcare administrators who control the dollars. Does that, does that ring true with anybody in this room? I think it's sort of interesting, right? All right, so what are we doing in Louisville? So Dr. Bowley alluded to some of this. Um, we've tried to do a couple of things, and, and this is a team effort. We, we, we do have some integration into the general medical curriculum around business and medicine and innovation. Um, we've created a distinction track in business and leadership. So this was on the heels of the distinction and research track, which had been going on for a long time. The idea would be we would take a selected group of students, we take five or six a year, and run them through what you can think of as a mini MBA, essentially. So these guys come out after their first year of medical school, and we spent three years with them doing didactics and online lectures. And, uh, and the meat of the program here is this MBA level capstone project where these guys dive in and they tackle projects related to cost effectiveness or comparative analysis, or um, they've even done consulting work with, with startups and strategic uh, work with companies. Uh, and then, of course, we have an MD MBA program. So, what we wanted to do is help students kind of get an understanding of how we got to where we are. Uh, I think the press, by and large, around healthcare when you're a medical student is incredibly negative. Uh, we wanted to equip them with the ability to demonstrate and articulate the value in what they do, and then empower them to be good stewards of our collective resources. So the distinction track was uh, created in 2012, described it. Our initial sort of review of, of what students thought, this is the um, ACGME, not ACGME, the, uh, what is the undergraduate version of that? Yeah, LCME graduation survey looking at perceived adequate education and the following things. And this was the national benchmark, uh, and this was our group. And, and we took some pride in the fact that, at least compared to the national average, they thought they were getting better education. What was interesting about all of our kids is that they, they all wanted more education. So they, they, they learned a little bit, they want a little more. Um, once upon a time, the MBA program was nationally ranked. This is 2015. Um, the program is, has had fits and starts, but um, we had a good couple of years. It's been a little challenging lately. Uh, this was our crew. So we had a really um, student-focused group that would dive into projects. And so, you know, you might ask yourself, what's the value in all this? This is our mission. I'll skip that. Well, we felt like we contributed to thought leadership. We worked very hard to do things that are quantifiable, and we've had some a uh, modicum of success at getting that out into the, in, in the literature and the public domain. Um, the Department of Pediatrics really took this and ran with it. And these are sort of quantifiable benefits that were largely led by initiatives uh, with my co-director, Dr. N. Kim, who's the, who's the vice chair of pediatrics now. But this is what they were able to accomplish when they deployed certain projects um, in the Department of Medicine, in their clinics, um, reducing wait time, improving revenue collection, increasing capacity. Um, so pretty impressive. And every one of these was a student-led, or at least a student collaborative project. OK, so that's my experience at UofL. I want to spend the rest of the time talking about kind of my vision for the future. And so we've gone through a little bit of sausage making, set the table for why things are a little bit depressing, where we have some challenges. Let's talk about the future. And when you talk about the future, predicting the future could be dangerous business. I used to show this slide because it's kind of cute. And then I came across the fact that you really can buy a personal helicopter now. 
uh, which is a drone essentially that can park in your driveway. So this is available for like two hundred thousand dollars. If you're interested, um, I want to start with the idea of the kind of medical Internet of Things. You guys ever heard this term? So this connectivity idea that we can. So think about your Fitbit. Think about your Apple Watch, and how we can populate databases with personal biometric and personal data. And it's interesting that the FDA is actually starting to really pay attention to this. They're taking this data and they're allowing it to be adjunctive data in clinical trials. Um, this allows for patient engagement. This gets back to that idea of moving care to the periphery and empowering patients in their homes, uh, away from the hospital, things like that. So here's a local company. You know this company. Um, this, was an, this is an interesting idea. So the idea here is that software can impact disease. And we can, we can prescribe, if you will, electronic solutions or interactive technological solutions to treat disease and impact outcomes. And this is what this company is predicated on. This is uh, initially a COPD uh, focus for them. And it's essentially a patient app providing AI-based self-triage, what they call a smart symptom tracker. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think the FDA is really paying attention to this. They're working very closely with the FDA to figure out how can you prescribe digital technologies uh, and change outcomes. Amazon and this startup, Zelf, uh, are planning a pilot where doctors would prescribe products and they would be delivered through the, the greatest delivery uh, network in the world, right, Amazon, um, after patients leave the hospital. Okay? And this company enables digital healthcare teams to order content exactly like they would medication. And this could be for any disease state. The most useful application due to the fact that these are the most costly disease states are things like COPD, heart failure, these chronic disease states, hypertension, diabetes that cost a lot of money. So there's a lot of interest in how digital health prescriptions um, can, can uh, impact patient health. What about the prescription drug market? So 12% of U.S. healthcare spending in 2015 was prescription drugs. And you've all heard these ridiculous stories about somebody cornering the market on drug A, jacking up the price 50-fold, right? And even though it's been generic for, for 40 years, all of a sudden it's crazy expensive. So the technology is disrupting the prescription, generic prescription drug market in really impressive ways. This is a company called Blink Health. Uh, so this is Blink Health, and this is GoodRx. And their competitors. GoodRx essentially says, um, I've got an app, and I will, uh, you put in your prescription, and it'll geolocate with a price attached all of the pharmacies so you can price compare where you would get the best deal near you. Blink Health takes it one step further, and they're essentially an electronic virtual pharmacy benefit management company. And so think of them as kind of your online pharmacy whereby they've partnered with every major pharmaceutical and distribution network in the country. You type in your drug, you put in your credit card information, and they will distribute that drug and have it available to a pharmacy near you for cheaper than your copay in 90% of the cases. You can do this today. You can do this in your clinic with your patients. If they're on drug X, type it in, figure out what their copay is. Many times, it's cheaper through this avenue. How do they do that? They have everybody at the table. They have a tremendous network of pharmaceutical companies. They get lots of free stuff, and they're making money on the transaction. There's an interesting collaboration between Intermountain Health, Ascension, SSM Health, and Trinity Health. And these guys said, you know what? We're going to create a not-for-profit, and we're going to disrupt the prescription generic drug market um, so that we don't have to depend on a third party. And we'll just own that space and provide relatively cheap generic drugs for our patients. And they have millions of patients between the, the group there. You guys have seen the press around Apple. Apple's doing something pretty interesting. So it, does anybody have, you don't have to raise your hand, but I'm sure some of you have multiple providers in multiple systems with different patient portals, and it's hard to integrate that data, right? So you, you're going to see a specialist, but your primary care is in a different system, on a different EMR, with a different patient portal. How do you get all that information? That's what Apple's trying to do. So they're launching this integration of portals with strategic partners, really marquee healthcare systems around the country. So all of that is presented in a single platform and pushed in real time and continually updated. Wouldn't that be useful if you show up to the ER 
and you pull up your app, and everything from every hospital system in your past medical history is available. Turns out there's a company called MedFusion. I've, I've done some consulting with these guys that's been doing this for the last 10 years. They're just not as famous as Apple, but there are other competitors in this space. And so this is available today. Um, they're also using publicly sourced data to, to, uh, to do some interesting, interesting things with clinical trials enrollment. So you can, you know, you can log onto your Apple Health account and enroll in clinical trials. You can push your health data to their database. They'll do predictive analytics and some in interesting machine learning stuff, and I'm sure they're going to figure out all kinds of commercial applications for that. Uh, and then, of course, if anybody has the, uh, the new Apple Watch, you can get your EKG, you know, two electrode uh, tracing, pretty good uh, algorithm to look for atrial fibrillation, right? And so you can, you can tell at home and push your PDF to your doctor um, if you think you're an AFib and they can review the tracing. The problem with that on my end is it's not reimbursable. And so there's a great concern on the cardiology sort of provider side that we're going to get a lot of data, even more data than we already get, or additional reams of paper when people come to the clinic and saying, hey, look at my tracings for the last six months. I've got colleagues in, the, in sort of the private practice world that have established a fee schedule for this. So they'll say, you know what, happy to look at it, $30. Send it to me twice a month, $30, whatever, whatever the fee schedule is. Okay. So the value proposition for this, as, as sort of mentioned, they, they want to liberate healthcare data from the EMR through this uh, interoperable uh, interface and really to empower patients to use and own their own integrated health data, right? So they don't have to rely on faxing records from one place to another. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of interesting AI uh, applications here. Anybody know or heard of blockchain? <clears throat> All right, so Christian, what is blockchain? <laughs> Nobody understands it. So, so blockchain, I'm not an expert. I just wrote a, uh, one of our cardiology fellows and I just wrote a re review on personal health information applications of blockchain. It's a really fascinating topic. It's really hard to explain in a couple of slides, but I'm going to do my best. All right, so blockchain. It's a digitally recorded distributive ledger, okay, whereby identical copies of the ledger are replicated or distributed to every part of the network rather than a central server. So it's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network where every computer is a node and there's no server. And so any industry which relies on a central database or intelligence base or server, banking, travel, anything, right? All of our stuff, central database and set of servers, could be disrupted by a decentralized blockchain-based network, okay? Each node represents an equal participant, Within the network, each node automatically gets a distributed copy, comprehensive copy of the ledger. So anybody who's contracted to be a part of this network gets all that data in real time. Um, and so each transaction, whether it's a financial transaction or an exchange of information, is an individual block that's added to the blockchain. And so you create this network of consensus. So this is a trust-based contract of everything that occurs, okay? That makes sense so far? This take me, it took me a long time to sort of try to distill this down. So the idea here is the data cannot be tampered with or secretly modified by a third party without the knowledge of the whole network. So it's, it's meant to be an incredibly secure way to exchange information as well. And in fact, Sierra Leone, um, somewhat sort of in a visionary way in my uh, mind, um, just ran a presidential election based on blockchain technology. What if we never had any voter fraud anymore because we use blockchain, right? That's what they were relying on, and it seemed to work pretty well. So what about personal health information? It's fragmented. It's often duplicated. You've got, you know, patient comes to the ER. No one knows what's happened to them in the past, so they rerun every single test. There's a ton of money on the table here. So the idea is we could transfer this via blockchain-enabled technology. We could reduce overhead. We could limit repetitive tests. I think there's a tremendous amount of promise in this regard. Could you apply this to revenue cycle management? Absolutely. So what if you could reduce claims denials and secure patient payments? What if at the time of discharge from the hospital, you could use blockchain to enact a payment plan and there was no claims processing outside of this, right? Think of the administrative overhead you would save trying to track down claims if you had real-time claim settlement and adjudication and you could give the patient an explanation of benefits at the time of discharge. 
So claims would be quickly value, validated <coughs> excuse me, using machine learning across historical claims and remittance data. So these are all things that people are interested in exploring as applications of blockchain. What's happening right now? Well, Humana and Optum teamed up, and they want to they want a data share uh, for provider data, provider demographics, right? So they're doing this already. IBM's doing this, and, and they have the same goals. They want to reduce administrative costs, um, improve efficiency, um, <clears throat> and, it, and there are tremendous implications for claims processing and payments. This is a company um, called Behavior. So this is a friend of mine, Aaron Ghani, who was the chief uh, innovation officer, or chief technology officer at Humana, and uh, left the company to pursue this passion project of his. So his premise is that we can use virtual reality this sort of immersive experience is a fundamentally new and interesting way to change behavior. And anything where you've got this sort of chronic behavioral component to the disease state, whether it's smoking, depression, opioid addiction, PTSD, whatever, um, we could deploy this. And so there's a lot of investment in this field right now. It sounds a little hokey because I think there's a lot of hokey virtual reality stuff. But he's convinced that this is fundamentally different than a didactic or an online module or even a face-to-face -face clinic visit whereby this immersion changes behavior. And I can tell you that Bill Frist just invested in this. Um, there's a lot of interest in the company. I want to talk a little bit about data before we finish up here. Um, so data, these are amazing statistics to me. Medical data is expected to double every 73 days. <sighs> That's crazy to me. Um, average person is likely to generate more than a million gigabytes of health-related data, equivalent to 300 million books. So how are you going to keep up with this? How are you going to manage and sift through this data? <clears throat> it's impossible. So there's a tremendous interest in analytics and prediction based on that analytics. And every, every population health software tool has an analytics play. Every EMR claims to have an analytics play. Um, but there's a lot of potential promise here. What can analytics do? So <clears throat> analytics can inform or help you make the case for change internally. I think it can help you track and measure the impact of change or pilot projects. Um, it can identify opportunities in lost revenue, gaps in care, inefficiencies, or practice pattern outliers. Um, and what we really wanted to do is predict when and how often patients may need services so that we can deploy resources to the place where they're going to be most impacted. Okay, so that's what we would hope it would do. What it can't do is execute, right? So analytics by themselves are a tool um, that can inform strategy. They can't do it for you. So you have to have an infrastructure and a team in place and really a top-down mandate to, 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 to execute strategy, even when you have the analytics and even when it's accurate. It can't change behavior, you know, so you have to think about what drives behavior and how do you message behavior change. And as you know, physicians love change. Um, and, and right now, the data comes from so many different sources and formats. You know, we, I was on a group that, that vetted the population health software tools that the university was looking at. We were trying to decide how are we going to sort of dip into this population, you know, management stuff. And at the end of the day, uh, there were a lot of promises. Everybody promised the world, and they were going to integrate all of our stuff, and it was going to be cloud-based, and we could just ask questions and predict which group of people are going to cost us the most money, and which group of folks needed additional resources dedicated to them to keep them out of the hospital. But it turns out to be a lot of talk right now. And it turns out to be a lot harder than I think people expected it to be. And in fact, you know, IBM Watson was, was, was at the table a bunch. And um, they've laid off a ton of people because at the end of the day, they took you know, about $4 billion of acquisitions, tried to put it together and make it an, an analytics AI machine called Watson. And it's sputtering along. It's not as easy as you thought. There you go. So that's the press release for that. Um, in particular, building a predictive model takes a lot of data to train the model. So this is not a simple piece. Be careful of people who overpromise what they uh, what they want to deliver. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about this is what I call creative consolidation and payer diversification. It's a fancy way of saying look at all these cool people who are historically not collaborators, but now in the current environment realize they can't do it on their own and they have to collaborate. So you see a, you know, a new merger and, and, and interesting group coming together every day. Um, I think it's fascinating. So CVS and Aetna, $69 billion merger approved uh, relatively recently. 
why do you guys suppose CVS wants to partner with a healthcare payer? Why would the payer want to be partnered with CVS? So how, how close do you live to CVS? Half a mile. So this, this statistic, I can't remember what it is. It's something like 70% of the country lives in walking distance to a CVS or Walgreens, right? So footprint, right? And there's value in, in both sides of this. And obviously, they're doing this to make a ton of money. Um, Optum bought the Vita. You guys know what Optum is, right? It's, it's United's spin out for big data analytics, essentially. Um, did you know that United Health has 30,000 doctors in their employment? That's that sort of blew my mind. Payers employ lots and lots of physicians. Why would they do that? Humana's got doctors that they employ too, right? And so they're, they're, they're partnering with interesting models, interesting collaborations to try to drive down costs and hopefully improve quality. So this is a tool, Gawande, you guys probably know of his legacy, and he was hired by Berkshire Hathaway, this collaboration with a ton of money, right? And what, what Warren Buffett said is, the ballooning cost of healthcare act is a hungry tapeworm on the American economy. Our group does not come to the problem with answers, but we do not accept it as inevitable. And their initial proposition was, we're just gonna take our employees and we're going to provide better care and cheaper drugs for them. And so nobody in this room thinks that they're going to stop there, right, and be limited to their employees. These guys are spending a ton of money, Amazon, Berkshire Hathaway, and buying a lot of talent to change the way healthcare is delivered, to change the way we think about what is healthcare, how do we engage with healthcare providers, and what's that distribution network, most importantly, from, from the Amazon standpoint. My buddy Malik Majmadar, so Malik uh, was a year behind me in fellowship. Malik is now, uh, I think, the CMO of uh, the Amazon effort. Um, and he, was, he, was, he had ran an innovation group at Harvard. He's an interventional cardiologist. Um, but there are, there, there's, there's scope scooping up talent from around the country, clinical talent, to redefine and rethink about how other companies, traditionally outside of the healthcare space, might disrupt healthcare. Uh, and hopefully bring a smarter set of solutions uh, and an easier set of solutions to things that we, uh, you know, heretofore have not solved, okay? I think, at the end of the day, technology from outside the healthcare space is going to make all of our EMR problems obsolete. So the EMR is going to function in the background as something we don't even interface with. And we'll have a cloud-based iPad thing, right, that's super easy to use because guess what Apple's really good at? User interface and, and, and user design, right? And boop, 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 pushes to the patient portal, pushes to the patient, goes to the pharmacy, brings up real-time actionable data. Patients will be able to do the same thing when they're shopping for, I have an elective MRI, where am I going to get it? Am I going to pay $3,000 here or $300 there? Okay, that's the promise I see with technology. So there's lots of plans. Do you guys know the story about the Talateka Bridge in Honduras? So this is a hurricane-prone region of the country, of the world. Um, and every year, this bridge over the Talateka River would be washed away when the big hurricane came. And so the government said, you know, I'm tired of rebuilding this bridge. I'm going to put an RFP out worldwide to design the, the perfect bridge, the bridge that can't be destroyed, right? And so I think a Japanese firm won the contract. And they build the bridge and the hurricane comes, and guess what happens? So the bridge stands, the river, the river gets redirected. So sometimes the best laid plans don't work out the way you think. That is all I have today. Thanks very much. Take any questions.
Father, we pray you send the real power that we have. We do not know what you do. And secondly, show us your will. Let us have your will. Not that it's your will, but that it's your will. I need to know what you desire for me. I want to know your will. How we want to make it happen. How we define what our outcome is going to be. I agree with you. So my take on that is, you know, in the fee-for-service world, clearly the, the, the risk was we're incentivized to do more, right? And we see people in prison these days who did a lot more, right? Unnecessary procedures. And I think anytime you define any model, there'll be some potential downsides. So, you know, you might say, well, we're going to ration care or we're going to limit networks. Well, then the potential downside is we're going to under-refer patients for specialty services, right? So, Point well taken, and I think one of the problems historically is that the outcomes chosen, as I as I allude to, are not necessarily validated metrics or outcomes. They're not necessarily studied to improve patient care. They frankly just sound really good. They make some sense at face value, but you know, we don't do things that just sound really good. We do things that are that are backed by data, that are validated by clinical trials, that we know work in patients. And we don't do that in this space often enough because we haven't taken the time and spent the money to validate those metrics. So I think there's a real need for providers to get more engaged in that regard. I tell you, I spent um, several days at CMS um, discussing what metrics might make sense and which disease states might make sense for episodic payment models at the physician level. So those are hospital episodic payment models. What about if you, Dr. Winters, were on the hook? for cost of care over 90 days. And maybe any anybody who bills over 30% of that episode in the Medicare system is on the hook for the cost total cost of care for the patient during that episode. How would you define the outcomes and the metrics and, and all of that? So my experience was interesting, but I can tell you the government hasn't got it figured out. And it got super convoluted and super fast. Um, and, it's, and that's why we have to study this before we roll it out broadly, in my mind. It's a great question. The, so, so the bundle payment model does have a risk adjustment portion. Um, how accurate it is um, is is questionable and debatable. Um, one of the problems is we, you know, think about the patients as they come to us and how they come to us. It's not strategic. It's not by design. Generally, we don't have our own, you know, sort of healthcare plan per se. Uh, so they come as they come with disparate insurances with data everywhere. And so in order to, to really estimate risk, you have to have the full visibility to that population of patients and, and really care for a defined population of patients. That doesn't have a lot of influx and efflux, right? And so that's where the idea of population health, I think, holds some promise. If you have a defined large group where there, you've got some risk stratification, right, because it's a large group, and by definition, there'll be some heterogeneity in the high risk, low, low risk, and you can, capture that group over time, you may be able to
do a better job. And, and you, you know, people have outsourced this sort of predictive modeling to companies like Optum, who do it for a living. We live in the, maybe the most siloed healthcare system in the Western world in terms of where our data lives and how we see patients. And you know, frankly, if you're in the oncology center, um, you know, you might be on a different sort of historical EMR than the inpatient side, which is different than Norton, which is different than Jewish. And so I think it's incredibly difficult in a system like ours to get our hands around risk. And you know, so you can do your best based on comorbidities and socioeconomic demographics, you know, and, and the sort of snapshot of the patient in front of you. But I don't think, I think that's an incomplete picture. It's a good point. Point. Yeah, so there there's a there's a really nice round table, I think. New England Journal um, is a council that they have that, that addresses these issues with experts on, on, you know, talking about that very question. What, what is our role in the future? Is our, do we have job security or is it at risk? Um, and the consensus from that group, at least, was these are tools that enable us to do what we do um, in a more efficient manner and cannot substitute for us, by and large. Uh, and, and I think that resonates with me because at the end of the day, um, there's so much data now you know that that potentially could come across our desk it's impossible to integrate and keep up so for me these tools hold lots of promise to provide me with the necessary tools to make decisions at the point of care as opposed to making that decision for me i could be wrong and, and there may be there may be applications where you know what we don't need you and you just pop into a booth on the side of the road and scans you and whatever, but I don't know, I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you.